Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 54 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of April 26th to May 2nd, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next, oh, nearly half hour, I'm going to be ranting at you. I'm going to be telling you stories, being a raconteur, and uh, talking about things important to me, I think, deserve your attention. Uh, as always, any comments, questions, or reactions to the show can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you missed that, which you probably did, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be coming up somewhere around here a couple times during the show. You get the email address from there. The only thing I ask is that if you email me, Please include something on the subject line, like your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that, so I don't mistake it for spam, which I almost did a couple of times recently. All right, I've got a couple of things to talk about today. Um, I've been wanting to take a sort of a vacation from politics for a week. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to manage it this week, but maybe next week, uh, where I just wanted to spend an entire show talking about either more light things or more philosophical things or cool science stuff. But um, I basically, at least this week, everything after the break is not politics. all going to be cool science stuff. But I'm going to start with, with why I could not avoid politics this week entirely. Uh, the uh, trustees for the Social Security Fund gave their most recent report on Monday and was greeted with the usual doomsaying from the media. For example, the Associated Press started their article on it this way, and I'm going to quote that. Social Security is rushing a, a even faster towards insolvency, driven by retiring baby boomers, a weak economy, and politicians' reluctance to take painful action to fix the huge retirement disability program. The trust funds that support Social Security will run dry in 2033, three years earlier than previously projected, the government said Monday. And then, after a couple of paragraphs of deepening gloom, uh, the article declared, quote, unless Congress acts and forcefully, payments to millions of Americans could be cut. Meanwhile, the Washington Post is uh, taken to calling um, uh, uh, Social Security that all-purpose epithet welfare. Welfare that is slowly and inexorably crowding out the rest of government. They also called opposition to cuts in the program the result of self-centered, short-sighted intransigence on the part of seniors. Well, I have to tell you, uh, I'm pretty sick and tired of hearing baby boomers, or if you prefer the 60s generation, being blamed for every social and economic ill the country faces. In fact, to give you an idea of how bad it is, did you know that the armed right-wing militias of the sort that gave rise to Timothy McVeigh were actually the fault of the 60s? Yeah, really. Because, you see, in the 60s, people said question authority, and these people distrust the government. So, QED, right? That was an argument that was actually made in the New York Times uh, a few years ago. All right, but what about Social Security? Okay. Bluntly, the idea that Social Security uh, is in some kind of desperate trouble, that it's headed for a crash, rushing toward insolvency, is crap. It's utter, complete nonsense. Now, I know I've talked about this before, and I probably will again, because every time one of these reports comes out, it gets the same kind of doom and gloom, and I'm going to give you the same kind of truth. For most of its history, Social Security has been pay-as-you-go. Uh, now, the baby boomers, the 60 generation, my generation, we are a demographic bulge. It was recognized decades ago that when it came time for us to retire, it would place a strain on the system. So all the way back in 1977, payroll taxes were raised significantly for the specific and avowed purpose of uh, creating a surplus that could be used to draw on when the time for our retirement came. That's what you're seeing now. That surplus is being tapped. That surplus created for that purpose is now being tapped for that. And by the way, who paid the increased taxes to create that surplus? We did. The very people who tapping it now are being told that we're draining the entire system, sucking it, to, sucking it dry. Uh, well, the thing is, too, when people say the trust funds will run dry, what they actually mean is 
the surplus will be gone and Social Security will go back to pay as you go as it was for most of its history. At that point, if we do nothing in the interim, at that point, Social Security will still be able to pay 75% of scheduled benefits for as far out as the trustees calculate. Now, uh, scheduled is an important word in there. Scheduled benefits. See, the trustees make benefits of cost and benefits uh, based on a set of scenarios about how the economy might play out. Now, your initial benefits are based on a wage base. Wages tend to go up a little faster than inflation over the years, which also means initial benefits tend to go up higher than inflation or faster than inflation over the years. The bottom line of that is that 75% of current scheduled benefits in 2033 provide about the same standard of living that initial benefits today do. Now that standard of living is not great. The average Social Security benefit works out to less than $15,000 a year. So it's not a great standard of living. But to say that because in 2033 the system can provide the same standard of living that it does now means that it's insolvent or busted is transparent nonsense. It's ridiculous. And if we want to fix the system, well, it's been any number of tweaks have been uh, done to the system over the time it's been around. In fact, here's one I bet you don't even remember. In 1983, the funds were not 21 years from running dry, they were a few months from running dry. But thanks to a little tweak at the, uh, at the Federal Reserve, the system was preserved and now nobody even remembers that happened. Even though that was far more of a crisis than anything we're facing now. And you want to know the simplest, best way to secure the system? Remove the ceiling on wages subject to payroll taxes. In fact, you may not even have to remove it. You could just raise it. The level that it's at now is actually historically low based on the overall economy. Just raise it back to where it had historically been, and that solves the problem. And by the way, before I forget, there's another scare reference here. Uh, a reference to workers versus retirees. See, in the years to come, uh, the number of workers uh, will shrink compared to the number of retirees. And people say, oh, the terrible burden it'll place on them. But the thing is, workers don't just support retirees. Workers support non-workers, including their children, their spouses if they don't work, maybe other people. Family size in this country is shrinking. It has been for some time. Over the next few decades, the ratio of workers to retirees will go down, fewer workers per retiree, but the ratio of workers to total non-workers is going up. There are more workers compared to non-workers, so that scare tactic is also bogus. Social Security is under no danger of collapse, period. It's not. It just isn't. Not unless, that is, we get stampeded by ignorant lazy, um, sloppy media driven by fear-mongering politicians and their 1% paymasters into undermining it. And make no mistake, that's what we're seeing. As far back as 1983, a plan was hatched at a conference at the Heritage Foundation to, for a long-term program to undermine Social Security. Because the right wing hates Social Security. It has since it was founded. Because the one thing that the right wing hates more than taxes is government programs that work. And Social Security works, and it has worked for 77 years, and it will continue to work into the future. But the fear-mongering has had an impact. The steady drumbeat of, of, of doom and gloom has had an effect. Gallup polls over the last six decades have consistently shown that about 70% of the American public strongly supports Social Security. But increasing numbers of young people are becoming convinced the system won't be there for them when they retire. And that is part of the plan because they don't think it'll be there, their support for it weakens, it becomes easier to dismantle the entire system. And that has been the plan all along. Well, I want to say to anyone watching the show who has absorbed that meme, that Social Security won't be there for you when you retire, that it is nonsense. And the people telling you that either don't know what they're talking about 
or they are lying through their teeth. All right, we're going to move on to our regular feature, the outrage of the week. I have to start with a quick update. Last week, I noted that Representative Alan West, the man who puts the whack and wacko, uh, claimed that 80 members of the Democratic Party in the House are actually members of the Communist Party. Turns out that had some consequences. He was to be the keynote speaker at the district meeting of uh, the NAACP. Why they wanted him, I don't know, but um, he was to be the keynote speaker. They canceled him. They canceled the meeting and told them we're rescheduling it and don't come back. When asked why, the group said it had something to do with a recent statement he made about communists. But can't keep a good bozo down. Nope. On Monday, he criticized the FBI for removing culturally offensive material from its training manuals. He called this cultural suicide and said it proved that the Muslim Brotherhood was actually influencing U.S. policy. All right, but this week's Outrage of the Week comes from Reuters, comes from a Reuters report on these new laws that are being pushed in various states to um, restrict the ability to vote. I've talked before about some of these heinous laws, these photo ID laws in these various states. Well, in addition to that, there are laws in a dozen states that have been passed and laws in 16 more being considered that are restricting the ability of groups to do voter registration drives. And these drives are typically aimed at they, they target the young, the low-income people, uh, they target minority voters. And these laws are uh, making it harder and harder for groups to do that, making it more difficult for people to register to vote. Tell you how bad this is. One law enacted in Florida says that any group that wants to do a voter registration drive has to register with the state. And if they don't turn in to the state all forms within 48 hours of the time they are signed, they could be subject to fines of at least $5,000. This is a restriction so onerous that even the League of Women Voters is not trying to register voters in Florida this year. Um, in, um, well, that was from Governor Voldemort. In Wisconsin, we have Governor Walk All Over You, and he signed a bill that said anyone who registers anyone else to vote has to have a license to do so. And the requirements for getting licensed vary town to town. There are laws eliminating same-day registering, uh, the, uh, shortening the period for early voting, restricting absentee balloting. All of these laws have one thing in common. The people affected primarily are the poor, students, minorities, and the elderly. And those groups have w one thing in common. They are all less likely to vote for right-wingers. The thing is that we used to be used to ask ourselves, how can we get people out to vote? How can we get more? You know, the turnout is shamefully low. How can we get more people out to vote? Now, for the right wing, it's how many roadblocks could we throw in the path of the wrong sort of people? But the thing is, for the outrage of the week here, the outrage of the week right now is not really these laws. It was the opening sentence of the Reuters report. I'm quoting the opening sentence of this article. New state laws designed to fight voter fraud could reduce the number of Americans signing up to vote in this year's presidential election by hundreds of thousands, a potential problem for Barack Obama's re-election bid. These laws do not have a single thing to do with voter fraud. Voter fraud is a vanishingly small problem. These laws are about restricting the ability of the wrong sorts of people to vote. For writers to absorb that lie and then spew it back out as if it was uncontested fact that these laws are about voter fraud and that the effect on the poor and the minorities and students and the elderly is just an unfortunate side effect is incredible journalistic malpractice. It is, in fact, the outrage of the week. And we're going to take a break. And here we are, back. Told you at the top of the show that I wanted to spend some time uh, just having a little fun, like dumping politics, just for some cool... I have to admit now, I cannot completely get away from it. There's going to be a little bit of politics mixed in here. I just... not... 
not genetically capable of, of, uh, of completely uh, dropping entirely. But for the most part, this is just for fun stuff. This is our occasional feature and another thing. This is where we drop really political stuff, just for fun stuff, uh, uh, science stuff. Uh, actually, what I got here is I got a bunch of things related to science because uh, Sunday, April 22nd, was the 42nd observance of Earth Day. Uh, it was started in 1970 by Senator Gaylord Nelson. And um, I actually remember the first Earth Day. I, I cut my engineering uh, classes cut my class on I think I think it was I think it was uh, integral calculus and uh, I cut in order to go over to 14th Street in New York City and the whole the whole thing was all of 14th Street was blocked off we spent all afternoon there so I remember that that was back in the days when Earth Day had not been taken over by corporations looking to greenwash their message and actually was about Earth but anyway in in honor of that a couple things about science we got here uh, First, one of the cool things about science is that there's still stuff to learn. There's still so much, speaking of Earth Day, there's so much about the Earth that we don't know. Uh, in fact, there's um, a lot of uh, species out there we haven't found yet. Uh, we can figure that because we keep finding new ones. In fact, just in this last year, uh, in the Philippines, they found seven new species of forest mice, seven new species of mice. We found a psychedelic gecko in Vietnam, it's called a very brightly colored gecko, a new type of dolphin off Australia. And also in the Philippines, we found four new species of crab with some very wild colors. This picture you see up here, that's not false color. That crab really is purple with pink claws, which, that's cool. Okay, a purple crab is just, that's just cool. Uh, but since uh, moving on, let's move on into so to really future science. You've probably seen one of these. You've probably seen one of these uh, on, on TV. This is a tricorder. This is a tricorder. Uh, seen uh, seen in the Star Trek all the way through from the original series to the next generation and Deep Space Nine and the whole thing. And they were used by, you know, uh, Spock and Sulu and Geordi and, and Data and all the rest of them. Um, and it could do most anything. I mean, it could analyze the atmosphere of an alien planet. It could tell the mineral content of a rock. Uh, you could take it into the, into the sick bay and use it to diagnose illness or determine injuries or whatever. Well, obviously those are still far in the future. However, um, we've taken one little step in that direction. Uh, this thing. This is a handheld x-ray machine. Literally. It's not a big honking machine. It's something you can hold in your hand. Uh, there's a, um, there's a, a, a phenomenon in physics where you can actually get electromagnetic energy, that is like light, for example, electromagnetic energy, by uh, physical, purely physical means. Um, one way you can do this, in fact, you can try this yourself. Go into, take a roll of adhesive tape, go into a nice dark closet, and really just pop that tape off as quick as you can. If you're lucky, you'll see a few little flashes of light. Those are not optical illusions. There really is light. It really works. Well, apparently this machine uses some version of that same idea to generate x-rays, which are really just light, but a lot more energetic. And the thing is, because this is so small, you can hold it in the palm of your hand, and because it's so focused that you don't really have to worry a lot about long-term exposure, if these things are actually fully developed, and they come on the market, you'll be able to use x-rays for a whole lot of things. You'll be able to use them to find studs in a wall. You could use them to diagnose a, uh, a broken bone right on the site of the accident. You could use them to examine the metallic content of jewelry you could use for a whole lot of things. The, the downside of this, actually, is that probably for most of us, the first way we'd actually encounter one of these devices would be some cop stops us for, for speeding and has one of these in their hand and they want to x-ray us and, and the trunk of our car. But still. Um, anyway, since we're talking about um, Star Trek, we might as well head out into the stars. Um, the, the photo here is of a, of a galaxy cluster, taken, uh, I'm pretty sure by the Hubble this is a telescope. 
uh, it's a galaxy cluster, a cluster of galaxies, obviously. The, the kind of like the blue halo, that's overlaid on it. The blue halo is where the dark matter should be. Do it. Dark matter is one of the mysteries of cosmology, of the study of the universe. It's one of the great mysteries in all of astronomy. Here's the, th here's the thing. Einstein's theory of relativity explains how gravity works. The simplest possible way to explain this is to say that mass, the presence of mass, stuff, causes space-time to warp. People often envision it as if you took like a, a rubber mat and dropped different weight balls on, the, on, on that mat, how the mat would bend and distort under the weight of the balls. Um, that mass distorts space and the distortions of that, of, of that space affect how things move through space. Uh, a good comparison to that would be think how differently you move going over hilly terrain as opposed to a flat surface. So it's, it's, it's like it's expressed as mass tells space how to warp and uh, space tells mass how to move. That's, that's in, in its simplest terms. Well, the thing is, astronomers can look at stars, stars in galaxies. They can look at galaxies and clusters of galaxies and so on and observe how they move within those galaxies and relative to each other. And using relativity, they can say how much mass, that is, how strong the force of gravity must be in order for them to move that way. The problem is, the problem is the amount of mass that we can see is not nearly enough to explain the motion. In fact, it's only about one-sixth of what's needed. Five-sixths of the mass that's out there we can't see. That's dark matter, and no one knows what it is. But a lot of candidates, but they've all fallen short. Uh, um, scientists currently think that it's some kind of particle, some kind of yet undiscovered particle that interacts with gravity, but not with any of the other forces of the universe. That is still a mystery. And the thing is, dark matter just got more mysterious. According to accepted theories, there should be dark matter in the neighborhood around the sun. It should be everywhere in these galaxies. It should be filled with dark matter. There should be, there should be billions of those particles rushing through all of us every second. But the most accurate study of the motion of the stars in the Milky Way near to the sun finds no evidence of dark matter. The matter that we can see explains the motion. There's no sign of this unseen matter. No one knows why. No one knows why. And it could be that a bigger survey now planned, which will survey millions of stars, not just, not just hundreds, will actually show up the dark matter that this one didn't. It's also possible the whole idea of dark matter is wrong. The problem is the alternatives aren't even as good as dark matter. There's one called modified Newtonian dynamics, and this basically affects how gravity works at large scales, at huge distances. But that doesn't explain as much as dark matter does, and that also would contradict these recent findings. Another one called modified gravity involves taking relativity, adding three new fields, one of which has mass and therefore a particle associated with it. The trouble with that one is that it, instead of having uh, dark matter, which involves an undiscovered particle, this one requires three new fields plus another undiscovered particle. It could be that the particles involved in dark matter just behave differently or are distributed differently than we thought. Um, it could be the results of this, uh, these observations are just wrong. The point is we don't know. Right now, nobody knows. Right now, nobody knows. Uh, what we do know is that our current observations contradict the hypothesis. And that raises new questions which have to be answered. Um, and this is one of the things, a good thing about pointing this out. In science, in science, Science is not about knowing the answers. Science is about how you find out the answers. Scientists love questions. But since we're out in space and since we're talking about Star Trek, one last thing. What about life out there? What about life out there? Well, one of the things has always been, well, 
how do we recognize life? How do we know life? Think all life on Earth depends upon the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. All life on Earth depends upon that. Now, the chemical structure of of, uh, of those nucleic acids is not complex. In fact, it's the famous double helix shape. It consists of a long polymer, a long strain of sugars connected by phosphates. And hanging off each sugar is one of four uh, bases. And it's the order in which those bases occur that actually provides the genetic information. The question is, did it have to be that way? And the answer is no, it didn't. You can replace the phosphates with a sulfate, and it still works. You can replace the sugars with something else, and it still works. Now, the, um, the thing is, now, this, this works in the lab. It doesn't work in real biological systems, because those biological systems, there are enzymes which only work those sugars and phosphates. But the point is, there's no reason that other enzymes couldn't work with a different combination. Uh, what we have here is proof, not hypothesis, actual laboratory proof that life does not have to be life as we know it. It does not have to be based on the same chemical structure as we know. And the fact that all life on Earth is based on sugars and phosphates may have been by chance as opposed to something else. This also means this increases the number of ways that life can function. That, in turn, increases the number of ways it could have arisen on any given planet. And with current estimates that the number of habitable planets, that habitable means uh, a planet, that ha that a rocky planet, as they are called, that is neither too far nor too close to its sun, it's either too cold or too hot to have liquid water. The number of habitable planets in our galaxy is now estimated in the tens of billions. The chances that there could be a Horta out there have just gone up considerably. All right, I'm about out of time. I'm about out of time. I'm just going to remind you quickly about our um, open house down here on, on June 16th right? June 16th from noon to 6. And come on down here. There's going to be some live programming. I think I'm going to be one of them, as I understand. Uh, going to be all kinds of things to discover and do and how you can get involved in doing a show and running a camera and helping with the tech work and being a gopher. Come on down. This is public access. That's what this is about. This is your channel. Come on down here and take part. But as for right now, I'm just going to say you have the best week you possibly can, and I will see you next week.